Welcome, y'all. I hope you had a great week. We're talking the Marvels and what I think about that film because the uh, they, they just released the runtime for it and it's now ranked as the shortest Marvel film to date. Uh, we're talking a little bit of what I was talking about last week regarding the ghost voting body. It seems like it's it's starting it's starting to happen. You know, it's start this the steps that I expected to be taken. Um, uh, seem like they're starting to be taken or starting to be talked about at the very least. And we're going to talk about some really cool astronomical, uh, uh, some, some, some new data that we got uh, ast- astronomically that kind of turns a lot of what we thought about the universe on its head. All right, y'all. So stay tuned. We're about to start it up. All right. Welcome to the Social Millennial Podcast. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, we out here, gang, gang. I hope y'all had a great week. I'm very glad that uh, who, who, whichever of y'all got to, sp- is, is taking the time out of your day or your evening or your night or your early morning or your commute to work, your commute back, whatever have you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out to listen to this podcast. Uh, whoever's watching on the YouTubes, thank you so much for spending this time to, uh, to watch. Uh, to enjoy, to partake. Thank you so much. We can. Um, I'm very grateful that we can build a community little by little, uh, bit by bit. Um, I said I hope you guys had a great week. I hope you guys are safe. Um, I had I had a great week. I'm out here creating, doing my thing, um, taking on more responsibility creatively on the production side of things uh, with some other projects that are not. Uh, that involve me, but are not for me. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty glad for that kind of getting stretched, kind of getting, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, spreading my wings. So, so to speak, using all of my gifts, if you will. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot has gone on. The world is a tumultuous place. Uh, uh, media has been a thing. WGA, uh, striking up a deal and, and beginning to, uh, to vote on it is a thing. And, SAG is still waiting on the picket lines, etc. Uh, but we're not going to go out. We're, uh, we're not going to talk about that today. Uh, that'll be for another another episode uh, for those for those updates. Um, but let's see, what shall we start with? This is a good continuation from a last week's episode because I talked about the ghost voting body. And for those of y'all who have not listened to the previous episode please go back and listen to it please if y'all haven't watched it please go back and watch it i'm letting y'all know let me get them views let me get them algorithm uh them algorithm ticks i mean a few seconds counts for a view a few seconds counts for a listen even if it's just a pass by even if it's just a comment uh hit that like button on youtube please right now as soon as possible uh get to it hyper hyper speed to it warp speed to that like button uh, share this podcast if you think anything was interesting about it. Uh, by all means, please do so. Comment what y'all think about what we talk about. Uh, what are y'all's opinions about what's happening? Um, if y'all like the podcast, if y'all think the podcast is trash, if you think I'm trash, tell t- uh, tell me. I am wel- I'm welcoming everyone. I'm welcoming the smoke. Um, but yeah, uh, continuation from last week's episode, the ghost voting body. Um, I have this theory that one of the prongs of the multi-prong agenda or multi-prong plan regarding the uh, immigrants uh, coming into the country um, and not being documented uh, has to do with creating a, getting this mass of people uh, in creating this adjacent designation to citizenship slash green card slash work visa that they all will fall under and then having enough of them that you can fudge the numbers um, fudge the numbers during an election to say if, if one person won, the other person won in the popular vote, um, and just kind of blaming it on the, on this, this side designation of people that they will give the right to vote. They're going to give them the right to work and they're going to give them the right to vote with this side designation eventually. Um, and so as a continuation, that's my theory of the ghost voting body. Why, why I call it a ghost voting body is because there's, there's so many of them coming in that it's easy to be able to just oh well it's this many of them assign are signed up to the program so you know it part of the part of the percentage of the vote becomes a wash basically 
because it gets a little murkier, not just the chain of custody of votes, but identi identif identification verification can become a little murky. Um, so the, the, tails, the scales can be tipped to either side. This isn't like a political thing where it's, oh, it's Democrats and oh, it's Republican. They're both going to use these people to their advantage. Um, as much as the right side, the Republicans will are are not necessarily anti administration because 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 they're not. It's more so um, not having them documented, not having them vetted, not having them go through the process, etc. So that if something does happen with any of them, you know, the the due process of the law can actually take place. Um, so they'll they'll talk a big game and f and fight a big fight with it, but. But once this designation is, is created and then eventually they're going to, with this designation, they're going to be able to work. And then with that work, they have got to be identified. And then with that ad new identification being created for them, um, you're going to, they're going to now, it's going to now be a fight in Congress for them to vote, even though they're, they, they're not fighting to vote. They're not trying to get votes and be part of this country necessarily um, to that extent, most of them. By and uh, by and large, but they're the the powers that be in Congress are going to fight for that being the case, and it pro will will probably eventually become the case, and then will we'll, uh what what will exist will exist regarding my theory, uh, but again it's just a theory. It is um I see it as one like I said one prong of a multi pronged agenda having to do with the uh, undocumented shrimpshrimps, um. But yes, yeah, so as as the continuation, that was just the tee up for those who didn't go see the past episode, uh, last week's episode. Um, it seems like it's starting to get thrown around. The idea, the idea. Um, this week, Governor Hochul of New York uh, put out there that something like eighteen thousand jobs in the private sector. Uh, off of 300 and something companies uh, have come forward and said that they are willing to hire the shrimmigal shrimmigrants, the illegal shrimmigrants, the undocumented shrimmigrants. Um, she put that out there. It's news now. The headlines are there. And even though there hasn't been like an actual move move yet to get them to work, the idea is that it's starting to be talked about. Um, Governor Hochul talked about something like this before, um, but just bringing up the point in passing, at least on the news, that it's a it's an untapped workforce that can benefit the our economy. So that that's how it started. That's actually when I started thinking about this this ghost voting body theory, because um, she was talking about that. She and not a whole lot. She didn't elaborate. She just kind of. Drop that and then moved on. Uh, but the headlines now. So the next step I, w I, I would see logically is prove it now. So now the proof of that, or at least what could be considered the proof of that is 300 and something companies coming forward that Hotchell or, or whoever she enlisted to, to, to petition these, these people, talk to these people, um, the heads of these companies have come forward to say that they will hire them if we allow them to work. See what I'm saying? If we allow them to work, if we give them a designation and give them the ability to legally work, there will be jobs for them. Now what's wild is 18,000 jobs in the private sector, what, th those are 18,000 jobs that New Yorkers could have. Right. Right, I, which I think is another podcast because I, I I I will rant, I will go off, um, but yeah yeah so, eighteen thousand jobs, three hundred and over three hundred companies came forward in the private sector that say that they will hire them, and so I I assume now the next step is hammering it home a little bit more that that idea that this is an untapped now workforce, and then especially considering that. The workforce here, by and large, wants to work from home. Um, now, it raises all other kinds of questions, like what kinds of jobs are these? I mean, there's not that many factories in New York, in New York State, I don't think. Um, are they going to work for Amazon, like private sector? Who who are these these employers? And what what will these individuals, shrimp shrimps, be doing when we can't necessarily validate their 
education level. You see all of the all of the stuff that now we got to think about. What's the education level? We can't verify the education level because they did not go through the proper paperwork and the proper filing uh, filing process, the proper vetting process in order to find out who they actually are. So we don't know the grade level. We don't know who has mental disabilities. Um, we or fun, who are functional but have mental disabilities. Um, so that's an issue. These people are saying, oh, we have 8,000 jobs, th th jobs, we're willing to hire the shrimp shrimps. Doesn't mean that they'll be hired. So you see what I'm saying? Like how it gets murky, real, real murky. Um, the waters get, get real muddy. Um, yeah, so, so this is like getting the ball, the snowball started, getting, getting the ball rolling, getting the talking happening, because then the next step is maybe a little bit more, more proof um, in, in terms of data. And then the next step is maybe trying to get the legislature and the federal government I mean, New York state legislature, but I mean, it, it, federal level is a thing because you've got them in Texas and all these other all these other cities and Chicago and sanctuary cities. So you're going to want a federal level thing designation. Um, and yeah, and I think that's what's going to end up happening. Inflation's getting wild. Thank you, Bidenomics. Bidenomics is trash. It's, it's tanking the economy on purpose. The Fed is tanking the economy on purpose. They said it. They said it earlier in the year. The articles are there. Dude was like, uh, I think it's going to be good if businesses just start laying off people. Just get rid of them for nothing. Just, just everybody's working. Business is good. Get rid of them so that they could try to, they could bring their intentionally desiring to bring the unemployment rate up in order to reset the value of labor. And that's what, and this isn't like a theory. I'm not, this isn't like a Marcus doof, patented kind of stamped theory. This is, this is a thing. The, the articles are, are there. Um, spokesperson for the Fed said this, that that's what they think should happen. Um, unemployment rate should go up a lot um, so that the economy can, the, the, their theory or their idea is that the economy is going to reset itself, um, which it's not, it's not. Uh, I, my now theory is we're going to, we're going to bring up unemployment and reset the value of labor, um, so that we can, sh we can do economically run other policies to shrink the middle class so that we have a much stronger, uh, uh, we have a much stronger class war, class warfare between those who are in poverty and those who are wealthy. So shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it till it almost doesn't exist. The uh, middle class bring up the, 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 the poverty line so that most people uh, are poor or most people could be considered poor. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's a very socialistic thing that seems to be going on. Um, because when you have leadership in the country, this country, I could say in any country that goes from sitting in a place of power, like in an autonomous power, um, with upward, uh, room to get to grow, um, not being dependent on other, on other countries for things, etc. like being able to be self-sufficient. Um, you, you, your country's in a, in that kind of a place. And then you decide to, to bring it down intentionally. That's, there's some things going on there. There are some things going on there. Um, and so, yeah, so yeah, so it's, um, I feel like I went down on, on a tangent, but I don't think that I did. Unemployment rate, uh, rethinking the, I'm having a brain fart. Shrimp insurance. So yeah, so I think this is the ball rolling. The federal, right, the federal level, they're gonna have to do something about it um, eventually the more that they kind of try to prove that this is an untapped labor force. So let's treat them as valuable because we can use their labor and more than likely it's, we can use their cheap labor. We need hands on deck doing things. And a lot of the people that we had hired that were working remotely figured out they could work remotely and we want them to come back and they're not coming back. They don't have a reason, but we want to make them come back. 
So it's all kinds of stuff going on there. Uh, just thought that was interesting that it's, oh, this looks like this kind of, kind of the ball's kind of rolling on this ghost voting body kind of deal. Um, it is wild on um, again, move now, now moving on, not again, moving on, not a main thing that we're going to talk about too much, but it is wild that Biden is on the, uh, is on the campaign trail talking about how, if Trump is allowed to campaign properly, that it's some kind of affront to democracy. That's very weird, very strange. And then it's very weird, not very weird. It was probably expected, I think, uh, for New York to rule in the way that they did, the New York courts to rule in the way that they did um, against Trump and want to dissolve his companies or his dealings in New York uh, without having an actual jury trial and without actually going to discovery and most of the legal minds that I know, that I know, that I'm connected to, most of the legal minds that I like to get my information from and my different perspectives from legally, um, see what happened with that as overreach, as a gross judicial overreach, like really unprecedented. I mean, you usually don't do what that judge did, rule how that judge ruled in that kind of case, like that's not a thing that ever happens. Um, and then off of such information that seemed to be objectively untrue. And when I say seemed to be objectively untrue, I'm not talking about dealings, business dealings that the Trumps had that, that people were, that, that they were bringing up anecdotally, etc. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about valuing Mar-a-Lago, the Trump property down in, in Palm Beach, if I'm not mistaken, Palm, Palm Beach, Florida, valuing Mar-a-Lago at $18 million. That's, it was, it's objectively not true. Like it's objectively false. You can go and see what the square footage is worth in Palm Beach and Palm Beach is a wealthy, is a wealthy area. And Mar-a-Lago is part of, is on an island and goes coast to coast on the island. Like it's mad land and mad buildings. The mansion has something like 50 rooms. The square footage there is crazy. It's like Beverly Hills. The square footage is nuts. So ju just the building alone, the main house alone with 50 rooms is not 18, uh, $18 million. It's more than that. So that the judge cited that or the judge wanted that to be a thing and then was like, oh, so he must have defrauded because he wasn't worth or didn't have the money is very strange. And even in business, you have someone whose net worth is X amount of money and the person is not necessarily going to have that net worth in liquid cash, like in their bank account. You know, if you say Beyonce is worth $400 million, she doesn't have $400 million in her bank account. That's not how that works. So this, this whole trial is really weird. It's really funky. And then to have the judge not, after all of that presented, all of the data presented, all of what was presented there, to not have it go to trial and have there be discovery to actually prove what's right and wrong and what actually happened and just do a summary judgment for a case like this was wild. I mean, unpre unprecedented for a case like this and it's civil and of course of course the uh the pertinent wing of the media is going to rush to the headlines to claim some kind of criminality to um, try to put a veneer of criminality on their headlines even though it was a civil case it was not a criminal trial so think civil liability. So a case like this often would entail a jury, would entail digging into what happened, and then the judgment is usually, oh, this person didn't defraud or this person didn't fraud them, the person didn't do this, didn't do that. Or if the person did, the judgment would usually not even end in jail time, it would just be a repayment of, a repayment to the investors. That's what would happen. And ipso facto done. And whatever payment has to happen, payment happens. Damages happen because it's, it's damages. And then that's it. We move on to civil trial. 
It's no criminality. So no one's going to jail. So the idea of Trump got convicted of fraud as if it was as if he's going to jail is is just what's going to happen and has been happening. Capitalizing on you, the public, not knowing your stuff, not understanding what's happening and just kind of depending on what the media is telling you, just kind of trusting it. Um, it's just wild, man. It's just the world that we're living in is on another level and it's only going to get more and more on another level. Uh, but yeah, so moving on, I wasn't going to talk too much about that. There's some more things I could say, but I'm not going to, I'll leave that for another episode for that kind of recap and, and, and update. Um, Hotchel, uh, uh, the web telescope. Oh my Lord. No, no, no. Yes. The web telescope. Let's, let's, let's do that now. I think that's, that's a better thing to, uh, to, to pull up now. Um, the James Webb telescope, more powerful than, than, than the Hubble, has returned some very interesting data. Oh my gosh, I was so hype when I, when I read this article. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna have everything down in the, down in the description. Uh, YouTube, you guys watching, it's gonna be down in the description of the articles for what I'm talking about. Um, excuse me, the articles for what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to put it in the description as well for the podcast. So y'all can, y'all can enjoy that. Um, if y'all want to see my sources, see what I'm talking about, get, get more detail. Cause I'm not going to, there's some details that I'm not going to go all the way into certain numbers that I'm, that they talk about that I'm not going to, you know, I don't have right off the, off, off, off the top of my head right now. Um, so y'all can go down and really get the juicy, juicy, juicy nitty gritty. Uh, but the James Webb telescope this week returned some really cool, data for those who like science and astronomy even for those who like uh who are into have certain religious leanings it's a pretty interesting set of information that has interesting implications if you want to run in that sort of thought exercise route um james webb the data that it brought back showed us change it sort of it it turns turns something on its head so a little little baby tiny snippet of backstory. Ast the uh, uh, astronomically, uh, think thing physics, astronomy, the astronomers studying space, the astrophysicists. The model that we have up to this point is that galaxies like ours, the Milky Way galaxy, disk galaxies, did not exist, uh, or didn't exist for a long time after the after. Our, our Big Bang event after the kickoff of this universe, the event that kicked off this universe. Um, the idea, the thinking was that these disk galaxies like the Milky Way could not really exist and sustain the closer you get to, the, to, to our cataclysm event um, because everything is kind of close together, one, um, as it's expanding out, things are kind of close together. They're not going to, there's not the time existing to, to, for, for matter to develop in the way that it does for mat for things massive enough to develop, to develop, um, to develop the way that they would over billions of years in order to create such a style of galaxy. Um, things are crashing into each other, you know, detangling with each other, all these, all these, um, uh, celestial bodies that are starting very small and just and and not the, the 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 there's nothing massive enough that's creating enough gravity for this style of galaxy to have existed or should have existed um that's the model that's that's the thinking at this at this point right now or was um in astrophysics and astron and, and astronomy um but data from the James Webb telescope uh, has now shed some other light on that idea, um, on that model, because the data that it brought back is showing that there were Milky Way galaxies, Milky Way style galaxies, disk galaxies, far earlier, that formed far earlier in the universe's life than we thought, than we previously thought. Um, it's wild. I was like, whoa, this is huge. Super huge. Because it, it, and I mean, to some it might be like, oh, well, you know, okay, it, it happened earlier. All right. What, what's the big deal? Um, 
it means that now we got to start questioning all the other models. It's like a cascade. So it's like, if these Milky Way style galaxies, these disk galaxies has existed that long ago and that close to the cataclysm event now, mind you, when we say closer to the cataclysm cataclysm event, that they were around much, they've been, they've been around or these style of this style of galaxy has been around far longer than we thought. I'm not necessarily saying it's like the big bang happened and then, or the cataclysm event happened and then poofed out Milky Way style galaxies. No, 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 no. These are like, this is a long time of span of still, it still represents a long period of time. But instead of it being this long of a period of time, it's this long of a period of time. And that is significant, super significant. But so, so the era that we thought there should not be these styles of galaxies, because we, we understand that it takes a long, long time. Um, certain conditions have to be met for these galaxies to exist that we understood those conditions could not have been met at that time period were they, 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 they existed a lot of them. And so now it's a cascade kind of, um, how did they exist or how could they have been in existence that early? Um, is the universe older than we thought it was? Is it even older than we think it is? Um, um, are these galaxies still existing just because the universe has expanded for such a long time? We don't see them. There could be more galaxies that exist than so far documented. I mean, we always thought that there were more because we can't, we can only see, but so far, you know, we can only ping out so far to, to, to get so far. Um, but man, what a doozy. And I'm a person who likes science um, and physics, etc. cetera. Um, so I was like, yo. And then from like, cause I want to be like the religious aspect. Um, I just kind of am in awe. Um, some of y'all might not agree with me or, 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 or might not share my, my viewpoint regarding the universe's existence. Um, but to think that there were so many Milky Way style galaxies with so much more potential of more life, um, to think of the power of creation in that way, to think of, well, maybe maybe the things that we hear about creation of the universe in religion, then maybe there might be some, 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 uh, something to it. This is what caused me, causes me to start thinking about that. Though start thinking about those kinds of things. Um, I might do another podcast, another episode or, or, or maybe put it on, on a Patreon video. Um, how I, how I think that science and religion interlock with each other, how they marry with each other. Um, but that's for another rep. That's for another episode. That's for another, uh, that's for another deep dive video, special specialty video, um, that I'll put behind a paywall. So you guys will have a choice to enjoy it or not to enjoy it. Um, but yeah, so I'm super hype about it. Uh, I don't know about y'all whole bunch of galaxies with a whole bunch of celestial bodies in them. How much more life could exist in the universe? Um, over billions and billions and billions and billions of years. There's gotta be, there's gotta be, it's gotta be, it's gotta be a thing for real. Um, at least that's what we're perceiving based on the data that we're getting, because then, you know, we kind of don't really know. Cause there's, you know, I have my own little misgive my, my own miss, 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 misgivings about, uh, about space and the data that we receive and, and the idea of the Van Allen belt and yeah, that's that, that can be for another video, but so far the data that the James Webb telescope has returned to us has returned that to us. And I think it's really cool. It's really shocking. It's sim it's a similar, it's a similarly shocking find in terms of turning the current, um, um, astrophysical model on its, on its, on its heads. It's, it's a similar sort of impact as to when we realized that the, pyramids in Egypt, the great pyramids are older than what we thought by thousands more years. And uh, which would then mean that the Egyptian culture as a civilization, 
uh, ancient ancient Egyptian old kingdom has existed earlier from from much thousands of years earlier than we thought that it did than it started. Um, that's really cool. A similar thing that kind of like it's a shocking, it's a rattling, shaking that now now we got to go look at all the other models um, because we plug this into those models and some of this doesn't add up. So it's really cool. I'm really excited to see what's going to come out in the coming months because of this data. Um, as the physicists get to work and, 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 and adjusting the models as we get new information. So yeah, so that's, that's that. And then um, Captain Marvel. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord, Captain Marvel. Um, I happen to, I happen for those who like Marvel movies uh, or might be fatigued, what have you. I really do like uh, Brie Larson. Um, I think she could be a good Captain Marvel. I just, from Jump Street, I just don't think that she was given very good material to work with. She can act. She can do it. Um, but I, yeah, I do feel like she kind of got shot in the foot. She kind of got shot in the foot. Her movie, the first Captain Marvel, that, that film kind of started Marvel off into the agenda of sort of the wokeness that is, that, uh, that has permeated it. Uh, but let me not say the wokeness, but more so... Cause it's not that serious, but more so, cause you can still make a really good movie. It doesn't matter, you know, if you've got LGBT people in it, it doesn't, as long as the writing is good and the, and the movie is good and the, the, the attention to detail is there and the narrative and the care and the love for the characters and the universe is, is there, you can make a great film. Um, the problems I think, so started with Captain Marvel, um, with this idea of getting inexperienced directors inexperienced writers to write for characters that you're putting $200 million, $300 million budget behind. Um, that started with, uh, with Captain Marvel, with Captain Marvel. Um, let me say on the director side, Marvel had been starting to do that where they're not really trying to work with big game direct, big game, big name directors because they don't want an auteur, a directorial auteur who will come in and sort of give his own, put his own stamp on the films because they want all the films to have the continuity um, in style or as close as continuity in style as they can get to, um, as they can achieve. So they kind of, I mean, even from um, Ryan Coogler, they're get, they were getting, from Black Panther, they were getting directors who were, they had started, started, because Black Panther, I think, is the first. Ryan Coogler is the first. That's like not a super A-list director like a Steven Spielberg or a Russo Brothers or a Joss Whedon. Not super big name, not super well-known. He's got his movies. He did Creed. They did great. He was climbing climbing up at that point, super hot. Um, so they bring him in and then kind of you have the studio has sort of the or is desiring to make it so that the director can't have is not going to push back too hard for their own creative vision and just kind of allow the studio to tell them what to do. Um, so we had that though really big with Captain Marvel. It was a duo directing it and I don't remember if they both wrote it as well, husband and wife duo. And that film was just, I mean, trash. It was trash as a film. It wasn't trash because Captain Marvel is a female hero. It wasn't trash because Brie Larson herself. It was trash because it was poorly written. It was trash because it was poorly shot. The internal logic didn't make sense. It was trash because Brie Larson did not get good direction. She didn't. Um, and the direction that they gave her to take this character in was not it. It was just really didn't make a lot of sense to me to, to make her be that kind of characterization. Um, um, and it was so bad and uh, so like kind of looked at as strange that the Russos cut her out of Endgame. I don't know if any of you guys know this, but she was supposed to be a greater part of Endgame. She was supposed to be in it with them. Um, the movie that we finally, that we ended up getting, the final version was, if you guys remember, some of you may not, she's in the beginning of the movie on a hologram talking about she has to go help other planets because of the snap. Um, so she's gone. This is Black Widow talking to all of them. And then we get her as sort of the cavalry coming coming in, um, 
at the end of the movie in the final fight. That's the only time that we see her. The Russos wanted to get her out of the movie. Um, they re they re they rewrote it and wrote her out of the movie because the characterization that they did, uh, those directors, the other directors did in the Captain Marvel movie. Um, they just didn't like it. It just it wasn't there for them. Um, they didn't want sort of the ideas like I don't want their that stink on our movie because then we're, they're they're. Their characterization was different in Endgame than the characterization in her movie. And so they were like, yeah, no, nah, this isn't going to work. So they wrote her out of it. She was supposed to be in it. In it. If y'all remember um, the end of, if I'm not mistaken, Infinity War, and they had the beeper and, and, and that, 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 that uh, Nick Fury had called her on the beeper and she showed up at the end of, of Infinity War. She was supposed to be an integral part of the movie. Um, and so I think it really, the woes were from there and set Marvel off in a trajectory that made their movies like die in, in quality. You had Ragnarok that was good because of the director, because Taika Waititi. He didn't write it, but it was good because his direction, which is great. They allowed him to kind of do his thing so that he could, you know, they needed they needed a shot in the arm because Captain Marvel was trash. Um, any other big 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 highlights? Right, it was Ragnarok, and I think I want to say that's it. I don't think any of the other films, even Black Panther two. Don't even get me started on Black Panther two. I didn't like it. I didn't. There are things I liked about it, but by and large, no. Um, so it kind of like the quality went down. Then we started going into, then we started with Marvel, which I knew what was, I knew what was going to happen when Disney bought, bought Marvel, they were going to, Disney was going to start trying to turn Marvel into a factory and churn it, churn it out, churn it out, churn it out. We need IP. We need IP. We need merchandise. We need to, uh, push Disney plus we need to. So you have all this work on these series. You have all this work on these movies all happening simultaneously. And of course, the creative mojo is going to start to wear very, 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 very thin. And you, with the amount, with the amount of speed that you've got to churn films out and churn IPs out, um, you're not going to, you're going to stop really paying attention to continuity. You know, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to have characterizations of the, the characterizations of characters for lack of a better term, be consistent across films. You're going to start to lose it. And that's what's happened. And I think that's people want to say that it's Marvel fatigue, but I think it's because Marvel Disney stopped putting out very good content. It became about quality. I mean, it became about quantity over quality. And the audience felt that. I, I, I know I felt it. The heart wasn't in it. I don't know where Kevin Feige is. I don't know what he's doing. Um, but he was really the guy in those first phases in the Affinity Saga that was really running the ship and wanting to make sure that everything was kosher and wanting to make sure that these characters were relatable, wanting to make sure that people can identify with them, wanting to make sure that they felt real, that they felt lived in, and that their characterizations had continuity from film to film, from appearance to appearance. But then as he gets worn thin because of the production schedule and how much that Marvel has to output, I can see it. You know, you delegate to other people. It's so much work. You got to delegate to other people. You have a story group now. You have story group meetings. You have this. You have that. And yeah, it, it's just, it's sad to me. It's just sad. Um, it's sad. To then go into multiverse after Infinity Saga, it just didn't, it was, it didn't make sense. I don't know whose idea that was. If it was Kevin Feige's, then dog, you need to reassess because it was trash. Secret Invasion, trash. Like just bad ideas, just bad ideas. And it doesn't make sense. Cause like, well, how are you going to go from infinity war? How do you go from the infinity saga that, have, that affected the entire universe to then jump to multiverse? Cause then it's like, we're doing multiverse and it's infinite multiverses. So it's like nothing really matters anyway. Like wait for multiverse till later. Wait, wait till time travel for later. Save that for when you guys don't have any other ideas. You don't just jump into multiverse. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it pulls the investment away from our universe and from our heroes because it's like what you're developing multiple universes to live in or, or, or the stakes are much lower now because there are so many other, other universe, like, 
yeah. But anyway, Captain Marvel. They released the runtime of Captain Marvel. I mean, it's called The Marvels. Uh, they released the runtime, and it is it is clocking at the shortest as the shortest Marvel movie at like an hour and thirty minutes, something like that. Um, I don't know. This film, I'm actually hyped for. Most of the people that I know, most of the people that I follow, um, they're not hyped for this film. They're like, this is gonna be trash. It's gonna be cobbled together. You know, they've been trying to get this, not get it all, get this movie off the ground, but get it, get it finished for so long. You know, COVID happened. Then the studios didn't like the 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 final edit. This audience, test audiences didn't like it. They went back, reshot it. They they reshot the hell out of this movie, as far as I can tell. So this movie cost Marvel Disney, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars to finally get out and it kind of feels like they're like just push it out already they delayed the film like two three times um it's now put in a in an area because i think it's dropping what is it did they push it back again i don't think so it's supposed to be in november supposedly um i expect them to push it back again but we'll see but they put it in a time where it's like this should be a summer blockbuster you know a girl power summer blockbuster because I really want to see it. It would be super cool. You know, I like female trios, lady trios. I like the Powerpuff Girls. I like Charlie's Angels. So it was a thing. Now I did want, I did want a Captain Marvel too. I feel like with what had happened to Captain Marvel, the character all the way up to this point, I feel like we could get a Captain Marvel too. And maybe we get the right director and the right characterization and let Brie Larson have fun. (laughs) <laughs> basically let her have fun she went through the ringer and r- I, I say she went through the ringer rightfully so but not really rightfully so she went through the ringer with the fans because the movie was trash and people really didn't like her so they started you know projecting it onto her as a person and that's trash absolutely trash behavior i don't think she deserved all of that um i could see i could tell there was a point of you know dep- a little bit of depression with that um but I'm hoping, I'm hoping they could maybe in the editing bay fix save this film. I didn't like the Miss Marvel show really, really too much. I liked the first half of it. Um, then the second half, not really. There was a lot of things that kind of didn't make a whole lot of sense there. Kind of stretches in that in that movie. Um, but I did like the character, and I do like the actress that they picked. I just think it's another cold. The culprit for that show, again, is more directing problems, writing problems, and so on. There were good moments, but it just wasn't there. I feel like that actress, though, I forget her name, she sells that part. So maybe if we can get that actress in the hands of a director, a different director in a feature film, we might get something cool and cute and and plucky and fun. Um, And uh, Photon, I'm down. I was down from, I was down from, uh, from WandaVision. I really want to see them represent her powers in a cool way. Cause I thought they did so in, in WandaVision. Um, but you know, my hopes are up They're pro- I'm probably going to be disappointed. My hopes are up because these, the, this is, this film is a great opportunity to stretch creativity, to try new things in terms of effects. But, uh, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this. Um, the trailers, you know, even though even though trailers are, the CG and trailers are unfinished. Usually, um, they kind of just got them the, got them the best that they could get them f- to release a trailer. Um, so I'm hoping that it, it gets better when we see the final film. But some of the visuals are going to look rough. The costuming is rough. It really does look like they're cosplaying. They really didn't do cool things with the costume. There's one version of the costume in the film of Captain Marvel's costume that I think looks really cool where it's like the one where it's still sort of military style with the straight and the small star, not the medium star. That one looked really cool. But then she gets a, a suit that's more fabric-y, kind of vinyl with like a big star, but I feel like it's awkwardly too large. Like the colors are off. It just, it's just a thing. I just hope that they allow Brie Larson to have fun in this film because the rumor was around Hollywood, around the rumor mills, that she did not like that this film was not a Captain Marvel 2. She wanted to do a Captain Marvel 2. They turned it into an ensemble film, and she was pissed. So we're going to see if that translates onto the screen. Um, I'm excited for the movie. I think a lot of cool things have the potential to happen, um, especially with Samuel L. in it. Um, I don't know what the story is going to do with taking them, like what places it's going to take them to. Uh, from the trailer, I understand parts of what this part of what the, the dilemma is and the story is. 
Um, but you know, I'm kind of I'm optimistic about this film. I'm optimistic about this one. I don't think it'll cure anybody's um, anybody's Marvel fatigue, but I'm optimistic that it's gonna be fun. Like I want to have fun, and it looks like it's gonna be fun. So I'm hyped for it. I'm hyped for it. Um, I hope you guys are too. Maybe you're not. You know, it's Marvel. A lot of people are like, man, Infinity Saga was where it was at. It, that's where it ended for me. And that's it. Because all these other films ended up being trash. Continuity being trash. Um, but we're going to see. We're going to see. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. I want, it to, I want it to win. I do. I want these ladies to win. Especially Brie Larson. She's been through the ringer. I know some of it. I will say that some of it is, 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 is her. There were some things that she did say in interviews and so on about the fan base that is kind of not cool. You know, you want to, you want people to come see your movie. You want people to enjoy your character. Um, you shouldn't be talking smack about them and generalizing them and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's a little, it's a little whack. It's not cool. It's like, it's like not good business. Like Rachel Ziegler, uh, ragging on classic snow white. Like, mm, let's chill out dog. Let's chill out. Okay, let's chillax. The check's cleared. Like, come on, come on. It was just a little tacky. It was just a little tacky. You know, it's not it's not wrong to state your opinions about you. I mean, you're you're you know, it's America, freedom of speech. You can say what you want, but you're in a press junket. You're trying to promote your movie. You could say your movie is different. It's going to be cool. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. You don't have to start kicking the original film. You don't. You don't have to do that. You just. You just don't. But anyway. I digress. Thank you guys so much for spending this time with us. Um, we are on Instagram uh, at Social Millennial Pod, YouTube at Social Millennial Pod. Uh, we're not on X. We are on TikTok at Social Millennial Pod. Pull up Sounds of New York, y'all, outside of my window. Um, but yeah, pull up, y'all. Give a like. Give us a view, you know, even if it's 10 seconds, make, uh, make a count, share it, clip it. Um, thank you all so much again for spending this time, even if it was a portion of the time. Thank you so much. It means a lot. Um, thank you guys for watching, spending your time watching. For those of you who are who are watching, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have merch, y'all. I'm just reminding y'all, if you go down to the link, that should be under in the description of wherever you're at. Um, there is a link there for merch. Get your shirts there. We, we, well, we had a sale this week. Um, get your shirts with the cool logo on it right here. Um, we've got everything from shirts, kids, toddler, pillows, posters, uh, mugs, travel cups, phone cases. I mean, todo. two designs. We've got a white and black and a black and white of the logo. Um, there will be more designs coming soon. Uh, but absolutely follow IG. It's a great meme dump. We have fun over there. Um, follow the TikTok. Uh, follow us on Spotify, Apple Music. I mean, Apple Podcasts. I want to say Google Podcasts, but Google Podcasts is going to be folding into YouTube. Um, so I guess follow the Google Podcasts. Um, I we don't. It's not all the way folded in yet, so we don't yet know how that's going to work. Following it from you on on YouTube uh, for YouTube Music. Um, but thank you guys so much, man. Have a great week. Be strengthened. Be strong. Um, it's gonna it's gonna be okay. You know things are getting rough, but you're strong enough. You can you can make it through. Take a deep breath. Uh, go to your happy place, and uh, go out there get that money. All right. Thank y'all so much. I'll see y'all next week. Peace.